Means this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Dr. James Hansen is widely regarded as leading climate change scientist in the country. It was his testimony to a Senate committee in 1988 that first brought the threat of global warming to the world's attention. For the past quarter of a century, he has headed the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, NASA's premier climate research center. Just over a year ago, Dr. Hansen went public with a charge that made headlines around the world, that the Bush administration had been trying to silence his warnings about the urgent need to address climate change. You may have heard Dr. James Hansen mentioned before on Democracy Now! His name has been cited by many guests on the show. This government, at the behest of its oil company contributors, has been told not to uh, put out information about global warming, not to allow the scientists to talk um, about their expertise with the press, about the connection between global warming and hurricanes. Uh, that happened at NOAA. There's been pressure on, on, on Dr. James Hansen at NASA. I think it's true that attitudes have changed slightly in the White House because they now see a political issue. But they have worked very, very hard to suppress the science on global warming. For instance, they uh, sent some junior jerk to try and keep Jim Hansen, who's our, one of our very top climate scientists, from saying what he thought. Apparently, a NASA aide um, was instructed to um, interfere with Hansen's ability to do press interviews. Actually, this completely backfired because Hansen is not someone to be told to be quiet, and so he just went to the media anyway, and it ended up exploding. Can you imagine what it would be like for one of the world's leading scientists who was revered by everyone to have this, this pipsqueak who lied about his credentials controlling what he tells the public? Just appalling. Uh, and, you know, the, the countries around the world would, uh, I don't know what they'd pay to have the advice of a Jim Hansen. It's the sort of stuff we all desperately need. And here in a country that actually pays him a salary and allows him to do his work, he's, he's silenced. I mean, I, I honestly cannot see the sense of that. I, I can't see who benefits. That last speaker was acclaimed Australian scientist and writer Tim Flannery. Well, today, Dr. James Hansen himself joins us in our Firehouse studio. His story of how the Bush administration tried to silence his warnings on climate change is detailed in a new book. It's called Censoring Science, Inside the Political, the Political Attack on James Hansen and the Truth of Global Warming. It's written by author Mark Bowen. He joins us from a studio in Watertown, Massachusetts. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Dr. Hansen, 1988, talk about the significance of that time. Well, I think it had become clear that um, climate was changing and that human-made greenhouse gases were a reason for the long-term trend in the climate. And I just wanted to draw that to the attention of the public because we really need to do something before the climate change becomes large just because of the inertia of the system. If we wait until the climate change is large, then it's too late to stop it from happening. So what did you do 20 years ago? Well, I just reported that the world at that time was getting warmer, and I expected 1988 to be the warmest year in the period of instrumental record, which it did turn out to be, and that humans were primarily the reason for this long-term warming trend. And of course, that was 20 years ago, and while the Bush administration has gotten a lot of attention for its uh, failure to heed any kinds of warnings, uh, there was another administration before that, the Clinton administration as well. And uh, I think Bowen talks in the book about uh, some uh, problems that you had with Al Gore, and, and uh, could you talk about how the Clinton administration reacted to some of the warnings you raised? Well, my, my concern is, is general with with both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations, they both feel that they can control what scientists say to the public. So their offices of public affairs in the science agencies are headed in general by political appointees. And they review uh, the press releases before they go out. So it, it doesn't really make sense in a democracy. The public should be honestly informed and then of course, the politicians are allowed to make the decisions, uh, and they don't have to follow uh, exactly what the science says. They have, there are other considerations that they have, but they shouldn't um, influence what is presented, the scientific evidence. And I object to that regardless of which administration is in power. Mm -hmm. 
So before we go on to the Bush administration, where you did have the most trouble, can you talk about what happened during the Clinton years and where, how you were able to express or not your research? Well, there, the one uh, particular event that um, stands out in my mind is when I wrote a paper called uh, Global Warming in the 21st Century, an Alternative Scenario, in which I emphasized that it's not only carbon dioxide, but other climate forcings, methane and black soot, and we need to address those also. And for some reason, the, the people uh, uh, in the White House didn't like emphasis on the non-CO2 parts of the story. And I just, uh, the press release just kept coming back, and I would try to change it, they would change it, and, and finally I gave up. I just couldn't get a press release through the way I wanted it. So, in essence, uh, in, in these kinds of press releases, there's a back and forth as the as the White House uh, or, or the environmental people at the yeah. White House edit your uh, your press releases. Yeah, and that's that's another strange thing because they don't even admit that it's going to the White House. You know, it goes to NASA headquarters and then it sort of disappears for a couple of weeks. And uh, where is it? Well, it's very often at the White House. And I mentioned that, and and now they try not to make that. Uh, known, you know, and that's uh, again something that's very inappropriate in my opinion. And again, it's happened in both administrations. So let's talk about what happened when the Bush administration came in. Uh, you were continuing to do your research. First, first of all, explain your place of work and the significance of NASA Goddard. Well, uh, NASA is important, I think, because of the global observations that we make from satellites. We see what's happening, for example, on Greenland and then West Antarctica. Uh, my laboratory um, is also involved in the global models that try to interpret what's happening. And um, we're also located at Columbia University, where we have the opportunity to work with people who have the data from the history of the Earth over thousands and millions of years. And you put together these different things, the satellite information, the information on how the Earth responded in the past when greenhouse gases changed and other things changed, and the models, and then you get a picture of how the system works. And that's what uh, really concerns me, because, the, because it's the inertia of the system which tells us we're, we're already pushing it so that it's going to respond more over the next several decades. There's a lot more climate response which is already in the pipeline and we haven't seen it yet. And that's why we have to have an understanding of what's happening so we can take the actions now before it's too late. Of course, the the, uh, the speech of yours that got the even more attention was then in the December of 97, wasn't it? When, when you also then raised again the sense that, uh, that, uh, that you were not only that you that the planet was reaching reaching the the tipping uh, the tipping level in terms of its the dangers of of uh, greenhouse emissions, uh, but also uh, shortly afterwards you started getting the articles appearing in the New York Times and other places about the direct attempts by the government to silence you. Uh, 1997. I think you mean. Uh, I'm sorry. 2000, 2000, 2000. Yeah, 2000, 2006, I believe. Uh, I gave, a, I gave a speech in December of 2005 at uh, the American Geophysical Union meeting in which I tried to uh, connect the dots. And the dots extend all the way to um, the role of special interests in, uh, in confusing the public, you know, in not allowing uh, a straight scientific uh, discussion of what's happening and what's causing it. Uh, and of course the main uh, problem is fossil fuel use. And the truth is we cannot put all of the fossil fuel, the carbon dioxide from all the fossil fuels back into the atmosphere without creating a completely different planet. The last time uh, that carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere, there was no ice on the planet. It was a completely different planet. And we have to realize we either are going to have to leave a lot of the fossil fuels in the ground or else we're going to have to capture the carbon dioxide when the fossil fuels are burned. And that just is not well understood. And the fossil fuel companies would rather that you didn't understand that. Who are those special interests, those fossil fuel companies that you're well, talking about? How do they stop the conversation? Uh, well, it's the coal industry and it's also the oil industry. And they, 
you know, they put out uh, disinformation. They they fund a number, a small number of scientists, and they, and they expect the media to give you a balanced story. And by balanced, they mean that the 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 scientists are saying that something's happening it have to be balanced by someone say, "Oh, this is just natural," you know. And even though the story has become very clear.